So uh, I got a real treat for you this morning. Um, we're gonna we're gonna learn about it in a second. If you have your uh, Bibles, I'm gonna have a prayer before I preach. Gracious Lord, everybody that is here needed to be here. You are a sovereign God, so you know that everybody that is here today, you knew. You know the words, the message that their soul needs to hear, the encouragement that they need in their life. So when they leave here, in the next just over half hour, they will be ridiculously changed from now to eternity. That when they go home, when they meet with their friends, they'll say, church is awesome, you should go, and uh, you have no idea what you're missing. That is, that is my prayer. That is what I pray the Holy Spirit does in each person's soul. So pray for those people back in Sunday school with all the little buggers up in the nursery with the littler ones. Bless them. Give them a great time as they look into your word also. We love you, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn to the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. I'll give you a second to turn there. <clears throat> the Song of Solomon. Song of Songs, it's called. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be right up there blaring at you so you can read. Song of Songs 1, yep. <clears throat> this is a book of the Bible that when I had my son read it, years ago he didn't believe that was in the Bible. He grabbed the Bible and said, well, I mean, is that really there? And uh, that's what most of you guys are going to say today also. This is Solomon's Song of Songs, more wonderful than any other. Song of Songs means it's the superlative, it's the ultimate song that Solomon ever wrote. Verse 2, kiss me and kiss me again, for your love is sweeter than wine, your fragrance, your cologne, your name is like its spreading fragrance. No wonder all the young women love you. Take me with you, come, let's run. The king has brought me into his bedroom. The author of this text is uh, no doubt Solomon. Uh, some believe this book in the uh, Song of Songs is an allegory, but it doesn't go with the rest of the Bible at all. Most serious theologians believe that there's no doubt it was written by Solomon, and it is the picture of snapshots not necessarily in order, okay? Just snapshots of Solomon's romance between the Shulamite woman and himself. It is snapshots of the joy of love, of courtship, and marriage. <clears throat> it's not of lust or the appetite of lust. It's of love. It is something that most people, I think, in our modern culture for the last 20 years have forgot what courtship and romance is all about. In Hebrews chapter 12, the second verse, third verse, in the text it says, the marriage bed is undefiled. And throughout the Bible, God depicts marriages as sacred and as holy and between a woman and a man. And it's a, it's a marvelous, the act of intimacy is spectacular. And the Song of Songs, I, I can't tell you why for sure it was written, but God put it in there. And you guys know me, as we study the Bible, we don't miss anything. We read everything, whether we like it or not. So it's probably good that we have a reduced crowd, because I think if anybody was here, they may not show up the next week after they read this. Maybe, maybe not. But this is a fantastic text on uh, uh, what I think a healthy relationship is going to look like. <clears throat> and uh, we're, we're just going to go over just some... We're not going to go over the whole thing. That's all there is to it. Give you something to do later today. You can read it all yourself. But we are going to read enough to get you to want to read it again. Okay? How many of you guys have read, read the Song of Solomon? 
Oh, good. Well, that's good. All right, let's close in prayer. Let's get out of here. <laughs> it's so funny because I'm like, I can teach just about everything. And I guess I got to teach this too. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it, take your Bibles and a... a Let's look at chapter 4. I want to read these verses out of chapter 4. Now remember, this, these are snapshots. You know what a snapshot is. It's not a chronological order. It's, it's a snapshot. <clears throat> chapter 4. You are beautiful, my darling. Beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves beyond your veil. Your ha hair falls in waves like a flock of goats winding down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are as white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. Your smile is flawless. Each tooth matched with its twin. Your lips are like scarlet rimmen. Your mouth is inviting. Your cheeks are like rosy pomegranates behind your veil. Your neck is as beautiful as the Tower of David, jeweled with the shields of a thousand heroes. Your breasts are like two fawns, twin fawns of gazelles grazing among the lilies. Before the dawn breeze blow and the night shadows flee I will hurry to the mountains of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense for you are altogether beautiful my darling beautiful in every way come with me from Lebanon my bride come with me from Lebanon come down from Mount Amman from the peaks of Sinar uh, and Hermon where the lions have their dens and leopards live among the hills you have captured my heart my treasure my bride you hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes, with a single jewel of your necklace. Your love delights me, my treasure, my bride. Your love is better than wine. Your per perfume more fragrant than the spices. Than spices. Your lips are as sweet as nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. Your clothes are scented like the cedars of Lebanon. You are my private garden, my treasure, my bride. A secluded spring. A hidden fountain. Your thighs shelter a paradise of pomegranates with rare spices, henna and nard, nard and saffron, fragrant uh, uh, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of fragrances, myrrh and aloe, and every other lovely spice. You are a garden fountain, a well of fresh water, streaming down from Lebanon's mountains. Young woman, awake north wind, rise up south wind. Blow on my garden and spread its fragrance around, all around. Come into your garden, my love. Taste its finest fruits. There are some unbelievable uh, pictures that he is telling his bride. Uh, he, he's telling her she smells phenomenal. Matter of fact, the, the spices that the nard and saffron, <clears throat> it is the most expensive perfume in the world. It's the most expensive even to this day, saffron is the most expensive spice in the world that you can buy. And we're talking about this thousands of years ago. And that's how he is describing his bride, how she smells, how she looks. He describes her. Now, this is romance at its finest, which I, maybe that art is gone forever. Because today, nobody romances, they just get it on. You know, it's like doing jumping jacks. When I counsel people today, intimacy is no longer, it's just like, you know, you could go to the store and buy it and, and feel good and go home. But that is not the way God ever intended it for, for it to be. It's, it, it, it takes time. Um, when I've counseled with people on how to have a, a much better relationship, I take them to these parts of the Bible and they go, here's the reality. First of all, if you if you look at uh, love, you know, I always talk to people about what really is love. And if you're really in love, it does hurt. When I work with people who are getting divorced and one spouse is just ridiculously mad at the other. And I always go, well, they still love you. Well, how do you know? Because they're mad at you. If you don't love anybody, you don't get mad. Matter of fact, you don't get, you don't even care. It's over. You're almost like, thank God it's over. Turn to a Song of Songs, chapter 8, and I'm going to start reading in uh, um, halfway down verse 6, chapter 8, verse 6. And this is what it says. Place me like a... We're almost there. Here we go. 
chapter 8, verse 6. There we go. Place me like a seal. Place me like a seal over your heart, like, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as enduring as the grave. Love flashes like fire, the brightest kind of flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. If a man tried to buy love with all his wealth, his offer would be utterly scorned. Isn't that, isn't that great words of love? I mean, how many of you guys have ever been in love? All right, nobody. Wow, that's too bad. And well, a few of you have kind of like, yeah, I think I have maybe a little bit. This is God's description of love. And uh, it's funny, I, I, one of the uh, channels I enjoy watching, it's uh, ID, Discovery, it's all these crime things, and who killed who and whatnot and what have you. But I always find that whenever there's a murder, they're always looking for a scorned lover. A husband, a wife, a boyfriend, a girl, a woman who snuck in and chopped him up with an axe, shot him up 500 times threw him in the lake with crocodiles, you know. Just unbelievable stuff, because that's the scorned lover. That's what happens. And I'm like, man, isn't, isn't that the way it is? That's love. How many of you guys remember what it was like to, to your first breakup? Your first breakup. Your first, oh, my God, I'm never going to live. Some of you guys, oh, I remember that. Oh, my God. How many of you guys survived? We all do, but, you know, it hurts, doesn't it? They don't love me anymore. They don't want me to do. You're going to kill yourself? No. And you got you're, one of your parents go, I don't know, there's going to be 50 others. Get over it. They slap you. Do the dishes. Take out the trash. You'll get over it. No, I won't. I just broke my heart. <laughs> what happens. I was a youth pastor for a lot of years, you know, and it's so funny. Oh my God, they broke my heart. What am I going to do? You're going to get over it. That's what you're going to do. Slap them. I, I know. My gift is not tenderness. It's not like, oh, you poor little thing. Poor little rose petal. You got a little, bro, little hurt. Too bad. So, come here. Let me take care of you. No. That was not me. Was it, Megan? No. Get over it. That's my kid. Get over it. <clears throat> so, I, I think, you know, the Beatles took that one right. If a man tried to buy love with all his wealth, his offer would be utterly scorned. Uh, what's that song? You can't buy me love? Can't buy me love. Some of you guys don't know that because you're very young. Oh, look at that's because there's no creativity anymore, Hunter, in the world. You have to listen to 60s and 70s rock and roll. It's true, classics. That's all they listen to is classics. They know all the songs that I used to know. How do you know that? That's all we listen to. So, that's a picture of love. Um, let's look how, how fragile it is. Turn to uh, chapter 2, verse 15. This is the, uh, it says, young woman of Jerusalem. And uh, I've used this example many times. This is what it says, uh, chapter 2, verse 15. Catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyards of love, for the grapevines are blossoming. N now, let me give you the picture. The picture is little foxes used to steal, come in and steal the, the grapes as they were ripening and uh, destroy the crops. And these, these foxes are small. I like three, four pounds. The example is this for you guys that are in love, that are married. What are those little itty bitty things that come into your relationship as a husband and wife and mess them up? Could it be whether or not the toilet seat is left up or down? Really? Could it be that the person does not know how to squeeze a toothpaste tube correctly? Yes. Yes, I am, Bernie. Yeah, but you were not, we're not supposed to say anything. 
you know. But these are these are these are universal truths. These are, you know. Um, could you pick up your clothes, or just leave them laying around? All those little things that seem like really. What is wrong with the way I squeeze the tooth? What is wrong with the way? You know, I left my socks there. Uh, wh what's the big deal? Well, it's those little foxes that come and steal the joy of your relationship. So what do you do with those foxes? What? Shoot them. Yes, absolutely. Yes, shoot them. Well, yeah. You deal with them. But it's funny because this is what, listen, Solomon, they believe when he wrote this, the Song of Songs, the most superlative songs he wrote, they believe he potentially had 143 wives already. Why do you need another one? But he is smooth. Fellas, you need to read this, contemporize it, you'll be happy, happy, happy. No, I'm not talking about more wives, Bernie. I'm not. I am definitely talk, talking about getting more wives, just one. But learning how to speak to your lovely bride, Sue nicely like look your neck is like the tower of david when i glimpse at your neck and i see one of those little shiny rocks oh my goodness yeah uh it's putting the romance back in your relationship you know i think it was uh i was listening to uh, i think it was chuck swindoll or dr dobson i can't remember one of those guys talking about the art of romance and, and their thought was, you know, in today's day and age, most guys are like dogs. They can screw anybody and have a good time no matter. But it's an art to love your wife and have it exciting for the rest of your life. And that's the song of songs. That's the beauty of a healthy relationships. That's the beauty of learning how to speak, learning how to pre appreciate and, uh, Verse 2, verse 1 says, chapter 2, verse 1 says this. I am the spring crocus blooming on the Sharon Plain, the lily of the valley. That's the young woman. Now, let, let me tell you something about the crocus is one of the rarest and finest blue flowers, and that's what they make saffron out of. Have you ever told your wife that she is the sweetest smelling woman on the face of the earth? I have. Luckily, she's upstairs teaching Sunday school, so you'll never know. Uh, the picture of how to treat each other. It was told me years ago, and I've done this, and you guys that have ever counseled with me, uh, I have said, you know, one thing that you need to do as a husband and wife is, is uh, make your bedroom your your place, not the place for the kids to come to roam around in. No, it's yours. It's all yours. It's your little nest. Your little, when you shut the door, all the problems of the day stay outside and you learn how to be a, a man and a woman together. And that's it. It's not a place for the kids to come jump in your bed with you. It's like, kick their butts out of there. I meet so many people who have very unhealthy relationships as a husband and wife because like the whole family lives in their bedroom. And I'm like, no, that is really unhealthy. Get their butts out of there. Well, why? You know, they didn't. No, no. You need you. You need you. You don't need them. You made them to get rid of later on in life. They need to see what it looks like to have a, to have a mom and a dad who love each other, not to have good friends. It's reality. And when you read the Song of Songs, it, these are the pictures that he gives us. Um, chapter 7. He repeats himself. 
you know, it's, 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 it's to be said that, you know, all great relationship, all great relationships, you can repeat yourself of how you love each other. Chapter 7, verse 1. How beautiful are your sandaled feet, O queen maiden. Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of skilled craftsmen. Uh, craftsmen. Your navel is perfectly formed like the globe filled with mixed wine. Between your thighs lies a mound of wheat bordered with lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, twin fawns of, of gazelles. Your neck is as beautiful as the ivory tower. Your eyes are like the sparkling pools of Heshon by the gates of Bath Ribbon. Your nose is as fine as the tower of Lebanon. You are uh, overlooking Damascus. Your head, head is as majestic as Mount Carmel, and the sheen of your hair radiance, radiates royalty. The king is held captive by its tresses. Oh, how beautiful you are, how pleasing, my love, how full of delights. You are slender like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters of fruit. I said, I climb the palm tree, and I take hold of its fruit. May your break breasts be like grape clusters and the fragrance of your breath like apples. May your kisses be as exciting as the best wine flowering gently over lips and teeth. Verse 10, I am my lover's and my claim and, and he claims me as his own. Come my love, let us go out to the fields and spend the night among the wildflowers. Let us get up early and go to the vineyards to see the grapevines have budded. If the blossoms have opened, if the pomegranates are bloom, there will there I will give you my love. There the mandrakes give off their fragrances, and the finest fruits are at our door. New delights are well as old, which I have saved for you, my lover. I have no idea sometimes when I I, I read you know, go through all the Bible, and, and there it is, the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon. Uh, and for weeks, I've been telling Tom I got to teach this, and he gave me a rendition that I never heard, and I searched high and low in this text for the possible rendition that you read about, and I can't get it. Can I tell him what it is? So the rendition is this, that Solomon is, of course, the king. And he comes and he sees this gorgeous Shulamite woman. And that, no doubt, she is drop-dead gorgeous. And chapter 8, I think, is really the first chapter because the king sees the Shulamite woman in his vineyards that he rents for these people to grow. But he doesn't look like the key. And he sees this gorgeous Shulamite woman who's tan. And whose features are stunning. And he wants her and he sees her, but he doesn't say he's the king. But then he woos her like no other. Oh, yeah, no, he woos her like no other. And then she finds out that he's the king, and he wants to take her away. But then in chapter, um, I think it's chapter uh, 5, or, yeah, chapter 5, when uh, 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 the woman finds out that that he's the king and he's there. But then her other, the guy that has been courting her forever, shows up at her door and knocks on her door. And it says that there she is waiting for him. And it says she already, in our modern day terms, she's, she's already showered, she's already clean, and she's lying on the bed naked waiting for him. Knocks on the door and she says, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm unclothed, I'm here, I'm clean. Do, if I get up again, do I have to shower again? And, he not, and it says, I, it is me, I am here, your lover. And she goes to the door, and it gives a picture of her sweating and, and nervously uh, taking a hold of the, the latch and opening the door, and he's gone. And then she runs out, puts a robe on, runs out to try to find him, but he's gone. And he's among the other lilies. So I think it is not a lover from the hometown but it could be, but I can't tell because this book is so crazy. It is because it's, it's as though God gives us little snapshots of what courtship and marriage and intimacy should be. Just enough for you to say, this is what courtship, intimacy, and love should be. Love, it does hurt. It is frustrating. 
those little things that get into your relationship. Those little itty bitty wedges that if you don't shoot them, kill them, bury them in the backyard, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Because see, Satan wants to steal the joy of your relationship as a husband and wife. He wants to totally destroy a family. Period. And he says, and, and the lesson to guys, guys, your wife, if you don't see a sparkle in her eyes, it's your fault, nobody else's. There should be a twinkle in her eyes. So there's nothing wrong with getting her very expensive perfume, dressing her in the finest things that you can afford. Nothing wrong with make your bedroom, your suite, your place. Not the place for every Tom, Dick, and Harry to show up. Just you and your bride. Not all the little buggers that you made. They got their own. They can go to the kitchen or something like that. It's just biblical stuff. It's how I know to have great relationships and to have a great relationship with your with your spouse. And uh, the, the Bible talks enough about intimacy to say that, listen, don't, don't screw around with it. It will bind you together with a, a love that is totally inseparable. I very seldom come across a husband and wife that has been married for many years who still have twinkles in their eyes, who still enjoy each other's touch, who still really consider how the other person feels and still enjoy being alone with nobody else around. It's sad when that doesn't happen. Your husband and your wife, your husband, your wife, they should feel like they are the most important person in the world. And if not, why not? It should be, for me, it's, it's God, my bride, Janelle, then the rest of my family. That's the way it needs to be. Um, if you've never studied the Song of Songs, you don't have to. Because, <laughs> man, I'm a theologian. I still get confused. But, but there's such good little snapshots of how to improve your relationship as a husband and wife. The sacredness of intimacy. And let's face it, we can look around today and go, oh my goodness, there is nothing sacred about intimacy anymore. But God says there should be.